I say this all the time, we set our expectations for kids way too low. Um, and as a teacher, I can't tell you how many times I had other teachers come into my room and say, you're expecting way too much out of this one. Or that one, absolutely not. You're not gonna get them to respond. And every single time I could do it. And it's just because you have the same expectations or even higher and they will rise to meet them. They want to so badly. It's just a matter of figuring out what's their access point and how do I get to it and persevering through it. Hello and welcome to Around Town Carroll County, the show about entrepreneurs doing wonderful things right here in our own county and how you too can build a thriving business and live out your own dream instead of being paid to build someone else's. I'm your host, Adam Stoltz, owner of Digital Consulting LLC, a company focused on marketing and content creation for your business, making your complex video projects simple. If you like what you see in here today, please be sure to subscribe, like, share, leave a five-star rating, and you can also donate to our calls right on our homepage at aroundtowncc.com. We can't thank you enough in advance for your support. My guests today uh, have a website that has over 200,000 views each month and a monthly newsletter with 50,000 subscribers. Each year, they support 2,000 educators through an online course online courses, conferences, and a resource platform. This past summer, their 14th online conference featured the legendary Julie Andrews as the keynote speaker to over 2,500 K-12 teachers and administrators. They are recognized as the largest organization to support K-12 arts integration and STEAM efforts in the world. Each year, they donate 10% of their annual profits back into classrooms through Donors' Choice Projects as a way to give back to the community. And they've had the honor of being a keynote speaker at the U.S. Department of Education for their Arts and Education event and speak around the world on arts integration, STEAM, and innovation in the K-12 through schools. Please help me welcome to the show the CEO and the Chief Academic Officer for the Institute for Arts, Integration, and STEAM, Ms. Susan Riley and Ms. Tiffany Harris. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, absolutely. Our Thank pleasure. Yeah. Us. Of course, of course. So for those that may not know, Mm -hmm. What is the Institute for Arts Integration in STEAM? <laughs> so it's an organization that helps K-12 teachers and administrators implement arts integration, which is integrating the arts to help teach reading and math and social studies and science, and STEAM, which is STEM, as most people commonly know, right. plus the arts. Good. I was, that was going to be one of my questions. I, yeah. I, I've heard of STEM, but I've never heard of STEAM. So they just added another letter. Another to it. letter. Yeah. Well, they added the most important letter because when you are doing innovation through STEAM, which is your science, technology, engineering, and math, those who are engineering process, the design process, all of that, it it calls for the innovation and creativity of the arts. So yeah. by leaving them out, we're essentially not finishing the whole process. Right. So by oh. having STEAM in there with the A, mm -hmm. we've definitely added back that innovation and creativity. Well, I love it because, you know, I, I, the arts seem to always be under attack. Right. And, and what I find funny about that is if you think art is not important, then get rid of your iPhone, get rid of your computers, exactly. get rid of everything, billboards, because it's all designed by an artist yeah. or a designer of some kind. So if you don't think the arts are important, take a look around you at everything thing you use. And well, again, right. and not even that, but get rid of civilization. Like yeah. the right. arts is what dictates what has happened and is it leads to our historical accounts of, of right. life in America or right. around the world. I mean, it's been documented that we as humans learned how to paint on caves before we learned how to feed ourselves. So, you know, I mean, right. the arts are it's the creative fingerprint right. to how we experience the world. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So, what what exactly are you doing with the arts in, in your organization? Mm -hmm. So, our focus is actually helping teachers leverage the arts to provide learning opportunities for all kids because everybody has an access point 
through the arts of some sort, whether it's singing in the shower or doodling on a piece of paper. And it allows children who may otherwise not be engaged in school or have difficulty with reading or math or social studies or science to have an access point in which to learn those things that make sense to them. So our job is to help teachers learn how to use that process. And it is a process that's, yeah. you know, that uses standards, connections and assessments and all of the things that teachers do and to make that process easier for them to implement so that it's something that actually occurs in the classroom. I love it. So it's not just art and art class. It's, no. it's art and math class and art and science. Yeah. And well, and I love it because I, I got fussed at all the time by my teachers when I was in school because I doodled yeah. all the time. But that's how I listened. And, and my doodles actually meant something to me. Yes. But they, you're not paying attention. You're not, I'm like, yes, I am. And I aced all their tests. So, you know, obviously it was, you know, but, but yeah, I got fussed at all the time for doodling because that's how I took in information and knowledge. Right, right. And so, and it, there is a process to that because it is how, you know, how we learn and everybody learns a little differently. And to have a basic understanding of how you can use those components to reach and teach every child is important. And it's not just art in math class or music in reading class. It's also reading in art class mm -hmm. and math in music class, mm -hmm. being able to really pull those together in a symbiotic relationship because that is how we experience the world, right? Why yeah. do we compartmentalize things in school when we don't do that in the real world when we get out? And we're always talking about, mm -hmm. you know, providing real world education to our students. Then why would we yeah. set them up for something that doesn't exist in the real world? Yeah. You know? It doesn't exist any longer. I, I know. mean, the way it was set up obviously yeah. made sense back in, you know, industrial, industrial times. times. Yeah. Right. But now Yeah, we're not in that time anymore. Right. No. It doesn't make sense. I don't come into the office and go sit in one desk to do my reading and then go sit in another desk to do any math work I right. have to do. It all comes together. So I think with Arts Integration and STEAM, we're giving that opportunity to pull in all of those subjects and really allow them to not only feed off each other but work with each other in order to better understand any concepts that the students are working with yeah that's great i mean because I, I, I yeah you do any job you're not you're not just doing one i mean unless you're in a factory and you have one of those where you just but most jobs you're not just doing one little thing mm -hmm. you, I, even though i do art and i joke with people hey i make shapes and colors move left to right <laughs> on a screen there's a lot of math involved in that yeah. even though i hate math i have there's numbers i have to deal with and figuring out where it is on the screen so I, makes total sense in my head that if you're not experiencing all of it at the same time to get it to work together, how does it benefit you? Yeah. And, and this isn't just something that sounds, it, it sounds fun, right? And people are always like, wow, that sounds fun. I would have loved to learn like that in school. Here's the thing though. The, the teachers that actually implement this are seeing up to a 20% increase in student achievement. Mm -hmm. If you implement it well, it's not just fun and it's not just arts and crafts. It's having a real impact on how students are learning yeah. and their success in the world. So I think it's not it's, it can't be something that we dismiss. And that's that's what's exciting for us is that when we can help teachers figure out how to use this process well, that it has a direct impact yeah. on students and that impacts, you know, generations yeah. yeah yeah no we talk a lot about on the show is is you know current generations just kind of are what they are but if you can reach the younger generation and mm -hmm. get them to change mm -hmm. that's and honestly what's scary to me is the tech companies realize this mm -hmm. they don't care if you don't like the ipad or the iphone right. they know if they get it in your kids hands then the next generation is just going to be used to it and it doesn't matter yeah. what you think right. so you know, I, I get getting the younger generation and getting them up to speed on how things could be and be better, I think, is, is key to mm -hmm. a lot of our troubles right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so is this is, is all your teaching online or do you do any in-person stuff with teachers or it's everything's online. online. And it has been since we started in 2009. So <laughs> when COVID hit and everybody had to shift over to, you know, online everything, we were kind of like. This is normal. <laughs> this is right. normal for do. us, which is is interesting. There's definitely um, some shifts that you have to make when you are teaching online and when yeah. you're learning online. As I think everybody learned that you know you can't just plop in front of a screen and, and expect to absorb everything. And what's great for us is that we've learned that over time. We figured out uh, what's engaging for teachers and for any learner actually, and and how to leverage that in a way that makes their learning experience you know, enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Right. Good. Good. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit. We usually save this for later in the show, but let's talk about Carroll County and why Westminster, because I, I, I've 
note, noted here that you put down Ting as a part of the infrastructure is that you liked here. Yeah. Let's talk about that we have fiber internet in our small little town mm -hmm. of Westminster and, yeah. and why is that beneficial to you? So um, when I first started, I, I've lived in Westminster since 2005. Um, my, my whole family lives here, which is great. Um, but when I started, I actually started as an educator and I was traveling first to Howard County and then to Anne Arundel County, <laughs> which, you know, an hour and a half drive of one way each yeah. day was a little crazy. I did that for way too long. Yeah. And, <laughs> uh, and so I had started our organization really just as a, as a project to document what was working for us in the classroom. And then as I started to kind of grow this organization and more people found it, I was like, you know, we could do this full time and it's all online. But I had a little bit of a, a struggle. We, you had mentioned at the intro that we had our 14th online conference just this past summer. Yep. And um, we were actually talking about the very first one that I held, which was back in 2010. And at that point, I think we, of course, did not have Ting. We, I didn't even have uh, cable internet at that time. I think I had DSL. Good old DSL. Woo! And, <laughs> and I was trying to run the thing live <laughs> and like with a chat and like things were just, people were dropping and things yeah. wouldn't run and I was so frustrated. Um, so, you know, of course, then we bumped it up to cable and that worked fine. But when Ting came in, it was such a great opportunity. I mean, there's no reason literally in our organization for us to go anywhere. We could go mm -hmm. literally anywhere in the world because we can all work from home. We can mm -hmm. work. We have an office space, but we can work from anywhere. Um, but the availability of Ting allows us to be on online all the time. And when we run an online conference, we don't have to worry about speed or mm -hmm. dropped calls or yeah. dropped, you know, chat. Everything just runs, which is fantastic. And it's not available very many other no. places. So no. it's it's awesome that it's here. Well, and, and as I know, and I'm sure you guys now know, I mean, video is, uh, you need bandwidth. Yeah. You, need, you need as much bandwidth as you can possibly get when it comes to video. I mean, I had a client that uh, they sent me, they're like, hey, can you download all these files for 600 gigs worth of video? I was like, nope, <laughs> I don't have Tang, sorry, I'm not, because yeah. on cable that would take a three day download. I'm not, I yeah. don't have time, unless you want to pay me for a three day download, it's probably not going to happen. Right. Um, but yeah, well, and you also had here, because I agree, you know, reasonable office space, tax rates, access to incredible universities, partners. So yeah, well, I mean, what else? Why did you stay here then? Why? Right. I mean, like I said, we could work anywhere, but, you know, in this corridor where we're, we're at, um, the the office space itself, if I were to try to find this, this same office space in Owings Mills or in Baltimore, it would cost me twice as much as it costs to have it here. We don't need to have an office space here, but it's so great because we yeah. can do some in-house videotaping if we need. We can we have a podcast that we record in-house. We have um, people on our staff. Obviously, we have them elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. Holly Valentine actually lives in Rochester, New York. We have subcontractors all over the United States, which is great. But our uh, our office team, they all come in and at various times during the week. And it's just great to see each other. Right. I think that was a lesson that we learned in COVID is, you know, we need to be able to see each other in yeah. community. Um, so having a space to be able to do that has been great. Um, and I actually don't ever want to give it up, I don't think. You know, I, I just think it's it's awesome. And it, because of the rates here, it's so much more affordable for us to just be here. Plus, you know, we have an amazing university system in Maryland between yeah. the University of Maryland and Towson and Johns Hopkins and Peabody. And there are so many um, world renowned, really, places that are 45 minutes from here. And a lot of them are doing great things in arts integration and STEAM. And so it's awesome to be able to have access to them very quickly. Um, it's just and, and in this particular atmosphere, it's a great community. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. we're in downtown. It's, it's so close to everything. We have such a great business community in downtown. It's just, it's a natural fit. Yeah, yeah. But we, we've experienced that through this show, uh, how wonderful the business owners are and the community in general. It's just, they're, they're, everyone's very giving, very supportive, and uh, just wants to see their community be better. So, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, let's talk about uh, starting small. Um, how, how did this all start for you? Because another thing we want to point out on the show is everyone thinks that businesses just open up overnight, the funding's there, and everything's just happy go lucky. <laughs> oh right, the overnight successes that right. you hear about that took 20 years to be an overnight success. So, yeah. so how did you guys start out? Right, so we started in my living room, in my laptop. <laughs> um, I was actually a teacher in Howard County. I, had, um, I was in the middle of my admin program. I got my um, master's degree in educational administration from McDaniel. And for one of my final projects in that 
degree program, I needed to do an active research project. And so in my building, I had approached my principal and I said, you know, I was doing some research and I found this thing called arts integration. I really think that would help our kids. So would you mind if I, if I put together a small team? And he was like, you know what, if you can get one kindergarten teacher and one fifth grade teacher on board, so you've got some, some variables there, I'll support it. And I ended up getting all of the team leads in every grade level, our special ed coordinator and our reading specialist on board. It was phenomenal. And as we were in the midst of this, of using arts integration, it was kind of trial and error at that point, because there wasn't a ton out there in terms of how do you implement this. Right. And so what we realized is we needed a space to document everything. Like what was working, what didn't work at all? You know, what should we avoid for next time? And then let's write some lessons and then just house them there. So I started a website. I just called it Education Closet because I was trying to find artsintegration.com and wasn't available. It was I was trying to find all the, these other things. And I thought, you know what? This is like the closet that is available in education where you just open the doors and see what's there and pull it out. Right. So we had called it Education Closet. And I was just using it as a like almost a lab sheet. And uh, that process gained a lot of followers. And then I moved to Anne Arundel as their arts integration specialist for the county. It was the first position of its kind in the state of Maryland, cool. which was awesome to build. But then again, building arts integration at a district level instead of at a school level, completely different. Yeah. So then I started documenting it. I started documenting that process on the site. And that's when I think you found me because mm -hmm. we started to have writers come on board because it was an open website. I was like, you know what, if you have experience somewhere else, let me know that. And so we had writers from all over the US who were documenting their experiences. And it became this blog, which was really popular and great. Um, and about three years into my run at Anne Arundel, I was really thinking, you know what, I think we should do this and have a bigger impact outside of just our district. I think we need to take this full out. Yeah. So I quit my job. I had enough in the bank to last for six months. Um, my husband and I agreed that if I couldn't make it work as a full-time gig for after six months, I was going to go back into the classroom and teach uh, because I loved teaching, still wanted to do that. Um, and it just kind of grew from there. I started out in our home office, um, very small. I think it was just me full-time for a very long time. I had subcontractors. Uh, Tiffany was one of my first subcontractors. So was Jamie, who's our current chief creative officer. Um, and then from there, it blossomed. We moved into our first on, uh, space, actual physical space on Liberty Street uh, four years ago. Okay. And then two years ago, we've moved into the space that we're in on Green Street and have grown continuously from there. Uh, it's been a really organic growth. You know, it's not it's not the overnight right, success. Every, yeah. You know what I mean? Like every year it gets a little bit bigger and a yeah. little bit bigger, um, you know, and the bigger it becomes, the, the more difficult it is, you know, bigger you get, the more problems you have. <laughs> but that is an opportunity to solve, right? The more right. problems you have, the more opportunities you have to solve those problems and to expand and, and grow. Well, and continue to challenge yourself. Yeah. 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 Well, how about how about you, Tiff? How, how has it changed since you came on board to, to where it is now? <laughs> it's completely different. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I started uh, in California as a, a, an English teacher at the high school level and dance teacher at the high school level. Oh, cool. And uh, when I was working on my dissertation and doing my research, that's when I ran across Susan and I asked if I could interview her and we chatted for a while and just yeah. organically she's like, would you like to write for me? And I was like, yeah, I could do that. So um, I spent a lot of time writing my Monday articles <laughs> for a few years um, and then uh, as this program or as the company has grown, she has um, invested in more courses and more certification opportunities. And I think uh, the certification kickoff is really where I got a chance to um, get my foot in the door with with the work that Susan was doing. Um, and I started just coaching learners on on the arts integration process. And now I've moved into this position where I kind of oversee all of our academic programs that we offer for educators. So like Susan said, it was very organic. It um, very much became a friendship and yeah. and kind of just moved into this, this joy of educating educators. Good. And TIFF also oversees all of our accreditation components, mm -hmm. which I don't think people realize what a big deal that is. We are internationally accredited. Uh, yeah. um, and it it's like a three year process it to get accredited. <laughs> <laughs> and TIFF really pulled that all together and keeps us in compliance and everything. But Good. that's important for teachers because 
when they then receive a certificate from us or they've gone through a course, it can count towards their required professional hours because it is accredited. Mm -hmm. And and so it's not just a fly-by-night program. Right. It has been overseen by um, organizations that confirm that this is a yeah is a well and program. there's so many opportunities right now especially yeah. in the internet where you can anybody can make a course about anything right right, right. you know right. and right. so um our process really forced us to show the credibility in the courses that Good. we offer um and kind of defend that yeah in order for um our accreditation body to yeah. to approve us well uh, and two things there um the first one is when you asked to interview Susan, was that for your own articles or was that just? No, that was for my dissertation. I was okay. working on my doctorate at okay. the time, um, looking at uh, competitive dance programs versus fine arts dance programs. And I ran across arts integration and I was like, that's interesting. We haven't yeah. heard that before. And so I just reached out to chat with her about it. Um, yeah. And it was, like I said, ended up being a good, a good move, <laughs> a good call, a good call, yeah. let's say. Well, I bring that up because I, I found that through this show is like, if you get some random person to say, hey, could you mind just talking to me for it, it's mm -hmm. I, I always just find it interesting what you learn. And, and what else I've found from this show is somebody would be like, I've known that person for years. I had no idea that they did this or right. they, you know, so right. uh, again, I'd encourage anyone if if there's someone you want to talk to or say hi, just ask, hey, yeah. would you talk to me for a bit? You think you might be interested what <laughs> what the turnout is, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, now I forget my second question, but that's OK. Well, that happens a lot on this show. <laughs> um, what what kind of feedback have you received from the teachers? I, I know you said that you've seen good things, but I, have there been any like like wow, this has completely changed my classroom entirely. Mm -hmm. Like it's just mm -hmm. night and day. And and, and, it's, and I guess more so, has it grasped the kids' attention? Right. So maybe the kids that are acting up aren't acting up as much anymore because mm -hmm. they're now engaged. Have you seen a lot of that through what you guys do? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna let you speak to that because oh. you get you get a lot of the feedback yeah, from our I learners. Yeah, I do. I do get the opportunity to to get really close to our certification members, and usually it's after their first quarter, which we call a sprint, that they are like, "Oh my gosh, this has completely changed the way I look at everything now." And so, giving them that new lens to look through then becomes kind of this catalyst for how they really start to use education in the classroom in a holistic way, ensuring those real world opportunities for yeah. students. And they see a change in their kids. They see the kids actually coming to class yeah. or not putting their head down when they're in class yeah. and a little less acting out because they want to be involved in the process and they want to be involved in the activities and the experiences that they're having within the classroom. Great. So we see, I get teachers telling me, almost immediately once they learn oh, wow. some of these underlying uh, foundational processes that mm -hmm. we teach them they see immediate results and they they really start to look at everything through a different lens which i think and if we go back to what we were talking about earlier that kind of that's where we want to go we don't live in right. silo we don't work in compartment and so this gives just the chance of them looking through a new lens is kind of giving them a new a new vision of how education could be i like it well and because i this is a little off topic, but I'm curious because my mom said this to me once. She used to be a teacher's aide at, at the elementary level, mm -hmm. and she worked with some of the, the quote-unquote troubled kids. But she brought something home to me one day, and she said, you know what's amazing? When you ask these kids that aren't expected to perform at a certain level, when you ask them to perform at the level that every other kid is, is, is at, mm -hmm. they do it. Mm -hmm. It's just the expectation that you set for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you speak to that in your experience in the classroom? I mean, like that, that we try, again, you silo, you're not smart enough, so you're in this class. So you're, mm -hmm. But if you expected the same out of every kid, it'd be, I think you might be amazed yeah. at how. Our, I say this all the time. We set our expectations for kids way too low. Mm -hmm. um, and as a teacher, I can't tell you how many times I had other teachers come into my room and say, you're expecting way too much out of this one or that one, absolutely not. You're not going to get them to respond. And every single time, I could do it. And it's just because you have the same expectations or even higher right. and they will rise to meet them. They want to so badly. It's just a matter of figuring out what's their access point and how do I get to it and persevering through it. Um, I think in one of one of the examples I, I use in one of my books is to talk about um, a, a little girl that I had fifth grade. She wanted to be the in the, the upcoming school play. And she was going to audition and her teacher came straight to me and said, you cannot put her in the lead. She can't read. There's no way she's going to memorize that script or read it or anything. And by the time that we actually produced the play, she was the star. The county executive had come to see it. And he actually pulled her aside with her mother and had said, you 
did an amazing job. You're an amazing actress. How did you do that? And her mother said, I sat with her because her, her mother was a single mother, single mother who um, had very little time. She was working two jobs. But she said to the, the county exec, um, I sat with her every night. And we went over her script and we went over her acting because this was important to her. And it was such a joy to see her just, yeah. you know, just be this person. That little girl, I mean, she this that changed her life to do that. And I think having those expectations, never, never thinking, you know, this child is lost or this child cannot possibly do this. You don't know. Mm -hmm. Try. Well, and, and I'm sure it's tough when you're in that environment every day, but for a teacher to be like, no, don't give them this. Like, what is going through that she person's... Was, I, I guarantee protecting. you she was trying yeah. to save save. Th save that child from embarrassment. Mm -hmm. That it, she was like, I... The, the teacher herself was was trying the best that she knew to protect that child. But even that's a learning lesson for everyone. Yeah. Maybe it's not your job to protect, right? Yeah. Right. Well, and and I had the joy of working with teenagers. Yeah. So oh, even more, even more <laughs> totally fun. Different. Anybody who knows or has worked or lived with teenagers, they are a whole separate species. <laughs> which I, which I love dearly. And actually, it was those problem child children that were my favorites. Yeah. Those were the ones that like, no, I I got it. Let's do this. But I think a lot of it is foundationally in education, we're dealing with people. And that means building relationships. Right. As with all walks with of life. With everything. Yeah. We're dealing with humans. So you have to build the relationship. If you don't have an audience that's willing to listen to you, they're not going to learn from you. And I think that's what makes the arts so important mm -hmm. because vulnerability in the arts is revealing your inner self in so yeah. many ways, yeah. whether it's painting or drawing or singing or acting or dancing you are you are vulnerably showing an identity that sometimes you might not share with others right and just that one expressive property of the arts allows us to build an even stronger relationship yeah. and that's where those so-called problem kids become your stars yeah well and we talk a lot about that on the show too if you're not being your authentic self that's what leads a lot to this depression and, and anxiety mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. feeling sad and lonely is you're not being yourself and, mm -hmm. and being your true, honest self and giving your gift to the world, right? I mean, if you're not doing that, it, it leads and to And that's some sometimes hard to do with math. It is. <laughs> it's, right. I can't, it's hard I can't to do in general. plus two myself. <laughs> so, you know, the arts really give a voice to yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's very, very true. Um, and again, this might be off topic, but I'm, I'm kind of curious. Again, since you're, you're dealing with humans and you're dealing with the public, these kids that might be the problem kids, I mean, you realize a lot of that probably has to do with outside influences mm -hmm. in their life, though. Mm -hmm. So so how as a teacher, how do you deal with, uh, this will apply to all walks of life, but how do you deal with stuff that's out of your control when this kid obviously is not coming from a good background and is not going home to anything good? How do you try to pull them up out of that as a teacher? Because, I mean, then you got all the red tape as teachers and what do you, yeah. you know, you can't man, what a tough time to be a teacher nowadays, huh? <laughs> it's, it's so true. Um, for me, and I know that you can speak to this at a different level again because of your experience with older students, but with younger students, I always felt like my classroom is a safe haven. No matter what else is going on in your life, when you come to me, we can have a safe space for you to express yourself however you need. And there were children that came to me literally just screaming and and beating their hands on the floor and crying and not because they were having a bad day, but because of what? everything else that's going on and yeah. that they cannot hold in their body. And literally I would just give them a space to do that. I ha happened to have a, a large um, music closet that housed all kinds of instruments and I would let them to just go in there and to get themselves to calm down. And that allowed them to know that this is a space that I can come to and, and I can be myself. Um, and I can't control where they're going and I can't control when they're where they're coming from. But in that moment, in the classroom that I've got them, they can be safe with me and they can have a good, positive experience with me and know that there is maybe a different lens or a different way yeah. in life than they have seen previously. I don't know. What about for you? Yeah, well, and dealing with adolescents, again, is a totally different thing. Yeah. Of course, they, you know, teenagers hate their families and their parents. Well, and they know it. They age. know everything. <laughs> they know everything and they hate everyone. Um, but I think that goes back to what I was just speaking about with relationships. And it's a trust and honesty factor that has to be there. Yeah. Um, I've dealt with 
abortion and sex and drugs and divorce and all of that within the confines of my classroom. I believe it. And yeah. it's just um, giving them the opportunity to have that safe space um, and ability to, to talk to someone they trust. Well, and I would also think just the fact that somebody's listening. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I don't think people realize that. I mean, just lending an ear. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's probably it's probably works better than any therapy you could pay for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just the fact that you're giving that person the opportunity to realize that someone's giving you, the, you know, paying right. attention to you and listening mm-hmm. to you. What and you cares. Do. And cares. And cares yeah. about where you yeah. are and what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, real quick, let's speak about someone else that cares. I have to thank my sponsor here. And uh, that sponsor for season two is Target Community and Educational Services right here in Westminster. And Target is a client of mine, and I've been a fan of theirs for many years, and we can't thank them enough for their support, and more importantly, their belief in us and what we're trying to accomplish here. Target Community and Educational Services is a nonprofit in Carroll County striving to enhance the lives of people with disabilities. Through their Human Resources graduate program at McDaniel College, you too can have the life-changing experience of working with these amazing people while getting your master's. Find out more about their graduate program at mcdaniel.edu or Target's website at targetcommunity.org. And while you're there, think about donating directly to Target Community and Educational Services and help enhance the lives of people with disabilities. And also our t-shirt sponsor today is uh, from Get Up Fitness right here in the town mall in Westminster, Mr. Uh, Joshua Wonder, who uh, we're calling our super fan. He's been uh, very supportive of the show ever since we started. Uh, So we'd like to support him back. He uh, runs a nice little gym, does uh, like boxing classes for families and, and kids, and actually has a nice little Parkinson program for people that might have need a little extra special need in their workout. So thanks a lot, Josh, for the shirt, and be sure to check him out. And uh, Susan, I'm, I'm, you told me that you're aware of Target Community Educational yeah. Services, correct? Yeah, my sister-in-law actually uses Target Services. Uh, that she enjoys their gala every year. Yeah. Um, they have done amazing work with her and with, I know, many of her um, peers. And just I can't say enough good things about them. Yeah, they're, they're wonderful people up there. Um, I know Tom and Gail personally. Um, who, who Tom runs the place. Mm-hmm. Gail, I think, is their marketing director. But they're all wonderful up there. And just real quick, they're, uh, the McDaniel College's Human Services Management Program is a 30-credit program where you can get 80% of your tuition scholarship paid for and you receive an annual stipend of $26,000 and did I mention um, all the graduate seekers out there get free room and board while in the program so if you're looking for human management uh, services there's no other place to do it than McDaniel and Target so Target thank you very much Um, back to our show though let me see if I can find my notes here all right I like this a lot so let's dive into that Slow is overrated. <laughs> That's what we lovingly called Susan Standard. Yes. <laughs> yes, there is a term for I, it. See, I would have figured <laughs> Tiffany had come up with that. Slow is overrated. No, no, I was also- <laughs> no. I'm okay with the slow. I'm okay. Yeah, our, our team does call it SST, Susan Standard Time. So when I ask for something, they will always ask me, is this SST or is this regular time? Uh, <laughs> is this normal human or superhuman time? <laughs> um, I, I'm a big believer that, I, I, maybe this is just my background, but when I, um, when I moved from you know, uh, a school environment to central office, the amount of red tape, I don't think I was ever prepared for how slow change takes to happen (laughs) in a larger organization. And I understand, especially in a larger organization like a central office or a large corporation, that there's going to be some levels of red tape that you're going to need to go through. I understand that. But for a smaller organization, and I see this all the time with entrepreneurs, people wait until they think they're ready. I'm I'm not going to start yet. I'm going to um, take, I have to get this funding and secured. And then I need to get this kind of computer set up. And I need to have a website designed for me. No, you don't. No, right. you don't. You don't need a space. You can open up your laptop and get started. You can teach yourself how to use WordPress. And it, it might take you a couple of weeks, but play around with it and start. Um, I feel like lots of times when people are getting ready to start a business or they have a small business, they feel like they have to go slow and cautious. And I think there are certain, certainly times for that. Um, But I also think you're never gonna learn unless you get out there and do it. So start before you're ready. Get going because the best teacher for you is going to be your failure. Yeah, I, we fail mm-hmm. more than we succeed in this organization, and that's okay. I would rather do that and figure out where do when we succeed, we know it's right, right. and then we can capitalize on it and build on that, which is great. Um, but 
yeah, don't slow is overrated. <laughs> well, well, and I because you had even brought up like there's so many online classes now for everything, mm-hmm. and I brought this up in another show. You know, it's okay to take one or two of those online classes, but unless you actually go out and do yes. what it is you just sat there and learned, you could take a million courses, yeah. and it doesn't mean you're going to be any further along mm-hmm. than where you were when you first started watching the first one. Unless you actually go out and do it, <laughs> it, it, it does. And like you, again, yeah. to your point, unless you go out and fail. And find out what you did wrong and how to make it better. Right. You're not going to make any progress to, to get anywhere, basically. Yeah, I've seen entrepreneurs literally be in a space for three or four years that and have done literally nothing. They might have a website, but they don't have any sales after right. three or four years because they, they have to take the next course, or I have to get a business coach, or I have to join this organization or that organization to make the connections. No. It, you will you will always do serve yourself better to your point taking action than you will passively taking in the information right right well and i've also brought this up too even if you're not good at websites you're not good at video you're not good at photos but you know you need them Learn as much as you can about that so that when you actually call the professional, yeah. you can speak their language, mm-hmm. you can know what to ask for, you mm-hmm. actually know what's a fair price. You know, yeah. I, I try to tell people that too. Because again, the more you know, it's only going to benefit you in the long run when you actually have to dive in and start paying people for this stuff. And, you know, I, I know enough with websites to be dangerous. Yeah. But there's plenty I would bow to a website guy and be like, you, I have no idea, so just don't take advantage of me in this area. But I at least know about hosting and, mm-hmm. you know, the bare stuff to get over that initial hurdle hurdle with someone. Yeah. Um, Let's see. So if, because I'm with you too, like I I want everything to be like yesterday and I don't understand why we can't change. A lot of people are scared of change. Why do you think that is? Mm, People are scared. This is from Bridges. People are not scared of change. They're scared of the transition. Hmm. Because you'll notice once the change happens, people are like, yeah, this is awesome. It's that uncomfortability where you're sitting in that transition period where you're not sure. It's trepidatious. You're, you know, uncomfortable. That nobody wants to sit there. And so it's the transition transition that sucks it's the change the change actually is great um, and people embrace the change when it happens but it's just that initial ideology that oh my goodness everything's gonna be different well it's I mean isn't that funny as humans though I mean it, we act as if change is somewhere stopped throughout history right. like I mean <laughs> right I, I mean I had a great grandfather lived to be 104 years old and I used to l- sit and listen to him talk about when he was a kid and it's like this guy saw all the world wars computers <laughs> being invented roadways being invented and it's like you know but people nowadays are like I want to go back to the it's like things constantly change you can't change is it's inevitable. inevitable. It's right. inevitable. It's going to happen. So, yeah, I guess it's learning how to deal better with the transition. The transition. <laughs> That's true. Um, well, I had something else, and then, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> are you laughing at me? Kelly's laughing at me. <laughs> That's why we bring her along <laughs> to keep keep me humble. <laughs> keep, to be honest. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Um, we'll see where this goes. Um, let's talk a little bit about. Uh, being a female in the workplace and running your own business, yeah. are, are, are there any unique challenges? <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask the single man here. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the one male. The one male man we have. Can, yes. It's a little reverse as most offices, yeah. especially in video. Yeah. Um, I, actually, I made the comment to Kelly the other day. I said every video company, their first hire should be a female because so many I, – I, I've worked for tons of video companies. It's all dudes. It's all it ever is is dudes. I took her on a shoot, and it's the shots that she got. It's like no guy would have thought to got getting, you know, not a single guy would have thought, hey, I need to get this little detail shot. And I loved them. So I, I, I was telling her, like, every <laughs> the first hire, every video production should be a female just because yeah. you're going to see different things than anyone else will. But, I mean, have you had any hurdles in what you do? Or, or, oh, yeah. Yeah. There's, um, you know, I think I was doing some research the other day. I think – um, female CEOs, if you are if you are making more than five hundred thousand dollars a year in your company, you are in the top two percent of female CEOs in the world. Um, and I think that number has to change. Wow. If I know it's it's amazing to me, and you know we are well over that, which is just it's phenomenal, and I'm so grateful for it. But it hasn't come without uh, a lot of hard lessons. And I think um, f- as women. You know, we're taught that um, to be a little bit more accommodating. 
Right. You know, you don't necessarily go and ask for the raise, even though you think you, you deserve it. And even though you have a million reasons for deserving it, you don't go and ask for it um, because it makes you seem a certain way that you don't want to be perceived. And that's just kind of built into us as females. And I think, you know, when I walk into a room as a CEO, I am probably the only female there. Uh, most times. If I'm not, there's maybe one other one, which, you know, then we, we're rocking it together, <laughs> yeah. which is great. Um, and we are immediately discounted mm -hmm. until we state how much money our organization makes in a year. Right. And at that point, then all the men in the room want to listen to me. <laughs> but ahead of that, um, oh, you're just doing a little internet thing. Oh, you're just, you know, oh, you're a teacher. Oh, good for you. Right. You know, um, and <laughs> when I tell them what our annual in revenue is and our annual profit margin, then it's suddenly, how'd you do that? What happened? You know, um, and that that's an irritant. You know, yeah. <laughs> if I'm yeah. really, really honest, that's irritating. And I think uh, because it's it shouldn't be abnormal right. that a woman could run a company that makes a significant amount of revenue. Um, it should be normal. And right. it, it, because women run the world, you know, isn't that what Beyonce <laughs> said? <laughs> Girls, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's true. Um, you know, and that is, I think that's changing, especially as we have um, a different generation coming into the business workforce, um, entrepreneurship, as entrepreneurship becomes more open with um, a closing a digital divide that I think we had a long time ago. But um, I've, I've seen it here in Westminster. I've been dismissed um, and, and, and it's okay. I don't mind. I'm like, okay, watch me, watch me. <laughs> right, yeah, <exactly. laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Um, but, but at the same time, I've also seen in Westminster that the, the wonderful you know, open arms of what can I learn from you yeah. and what can you learn from us in this back and forth. So yeah. um, certainly it, it's a it's a changing marketplace. It's something that we need to continue to work towards. Um, I think I would love to see m more resources put towards supporting <clears throat> female CEOs to get them so that it's not, you know, just 2 percent that yeah. are reaching that milestone. I think that many, many, many female entrepreneurs can get to that point. Yeah. Um, we just need to normalize it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I know Kelly's run into this. Uh, she had a gentleman come up to her at a networking event and he's like, hey, what do you do? And she's like, oh, I do photography. So that's cool. What do you do for a living? It's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> come on, man. Right. Are you seriously. Like. <laughs> And she's, you know, one of the best photographers in the area. No, yeah. you know, of course, no, no bias whatsoever. <laughs> um, but, um, well, no, and, you know, to, to, to young women, young girls out yeah. there, I mean, obviously, because even as a guy, you don't want to be rude or, you know, but sure. yeah, how important is it to be like, look, you stand up for yourself yeah. and, and know your, your worth, right? Because the that's other it. thing is, is I've had to learn through my business Oh no, that, that dollar amount you see there, that's the proper dollar amount of what I'm worth. Yes. And if you can't afford it, I'm not coming down. Mm -hmm. right? right. You know, so uh, yeah, w how important is it to know your worth and your value and, and make sure if someone's telling you the opposite that, that you get yourself to realize your yeah. own value. I think it's a, it's a fine balance. I mean, if you also have to know your marketplace, right? Like we work with K-12 educators. We're not going to charge that you could go out to the, the world and get an online class for $500, $900, $2,000. Mm -hmm. We're not going to do that for K-12 educators for an online class because they're teachers. I got to right. know my audience, right? right. So you got to you got to price accordingly with your audience, but you you do have to know your worth. And I I do believe that you know, particularly females sometimes struggle with that to know I can charge this amount. And even if I don't even if I don't know all of the stuff yet, I'm still worth this because my background, my experience, my tenacity, all of the things that go into who I am can can affect that value. Um, I think it's interesting in that same statistic that I read about the uh, the 2% of CEOs who are female making more than half a million. It also said that if, if a female and a male are both looking at a job application and the female looks at the job application and she doesn't meet every single criteria, she won't apply. If a male looks at the, the criteria and meets like 40% of the, the qualifications, they apply and they're like, oh, I can work on the rest, <laughs> right? Um, I think we got to get that, that mentality to change that I've got a good base here. Right. There's some things that I need to learn. So does everybody. Let me try it. Well, and that goes beyond even just applying for a job. I mean, if you open up your own business, you're yeah. not going to, 
if you, you're not going to know 90% yeah. of what yeah. you're trying to do. Right. So, you know, you know, <laughs> everyone will need to get over that hump eventually. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I mean, it, but I think it's just all like sociology. Like yeah. Women. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're still trying to get out of the kitchen. Come on. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, and I think that's just, it just exists. And so as opposed to um, fretting about it, I say challenge accepted. Like yeah. if you don't. Right. Right. If you don't see it now, that's awesome. You've just given me a challenge so I could well, prove it to you. And I believe, I mean, we are fully now in a transition period, I think, on a lot of fronts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's why, you know, things might be a little chaotic now is I, I, I think people are just sick of the old guard, as I call it. Mm-hmm. I, it's just things have been so one way for so long. And now with technology, I mean, things may used to <clears throat> change every 50 years a while ago. I mean, mm-hmm. things are changing like every year now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think that's another kind of uh, little fork that have been put in our you know society. Yeah, I, and to your point, and I think this is important to remember too. It's not just about um, you know looking at what you are or what you can offer and trying to con- determine value. It's also being able to take the punches, mm-hmm. to take what's going to come at you, and let it roll. Yeah, I think sometimes, and I know that I had struggled with this a lot when I first started. I took everything personal. Yeah, yeah we. You know, yep. I I take it to heart because I want to do good, and I, um, and I believe that people in in general are good. And so when something comes at me, you know, at the very beginning, I took it personally, and I would wallow in that. I'd be like, man, maybe I'm not as good, and maybe this isn't right, and you're wasting time. You're yeah. wasting time. I can't tell you how many times I get, I get an email back from somebody that's rude or that's not, you know, and it maybe 10 years ago I would have taken that personally and now it's delete, you're gone. Okay, not great for my community. Um, and I get it. It's not a good fit. Um, I think it holds us back in general. There's a there's an author, Stephen Pressfield, who talks about going pro. And, and I use this a lot now and I think it could benefit everybody who's running a business or working through business in any field. Um, is to look at a, any decision you have and go, how would a pro handle that? How would an amateur handle that? Right. Is, an, is a pro going to sit there and worry about that, you know, negative review that you got on Yelp for, you know, days? No. A pro is going to respond to it appropriately and move on right. and not let it affect your day. Um, and so I think being able to determine how do I respond to things rather than react to things is, is an important component. I, huge. Uh, I, I'm still learning. Yeah, <laughs> um, we all are. <laughs> I, I, I think I bring it up every show, but I'll just say it again. I mean, one of the first things Kelly, because Kelly's been doing working for herself way longer than I have. And, and one of the first things she taught me was like, this person didn't respond to me. They said they would. And you know, this person didn't call me. And they said, she's like, relax. People have lives. Yeah. Someone's grandmother could have died. Mm-hmm. Someone could have, you know, relax. It's okay. And it, it, like to your point, as soon as you let go of, you know, it's me and everything's about me and they're yeah. obviously ignoring me. No, it has nothing to do. The world does not revolve around you. <laughs> right. And the second you realize that, it, it's easier to not take offense to someone didn't and call that's a, you. Or, that's a teacher quality too because going back to the problem kids that you were discussing – like so many teachers would be, will get upset when the kid slams something or rushes out or whatever, and it's not about you. Right. That child has gone through so many other things, right. and they're bringing all of that into your classroom. And so, really understanding the human nature of it is important, yeah. and being able to say, "Hey, you're lost." Then. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's another point to the show is I, I think the whole world as a whole needs a kind of a, an emotional <laughs> awakening. An yeah. emotional reboot. <laughs> yeah, well, because yeah. a lot of people, I, me, guilty included, walk around with a lot of anger, hostility over small little things that should have been let go of a long time yeah. ago. Yeah. Um, now that you're in these echo chambers of social media and all meet, all news is negative, you, like I was talking to someone the other day, like even if you wanted to get away from a political topic, you mm-hmm. can't mm-hmm. because they're going to smack you across the face with it tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. And by the time you forgot about it, they're going to launch it again just to make sure that they're getting their clicks and all their, you know. Yeah. So it's it's tougher now than ever to let things go, I think, mm-hmm. and to get away from things that, that you don't want to deal with. Mm-hmm. Um, do, you, do you see... Like, do you see anything changing in teaching that might assist with teaching kids about their emotions more so than we have in the past? Yeah, there's a whole movement right now called social uh, social emotional learning, um, and it's it's right front and center, particularly this year. In there's a a very um, 
specific competency wheel on how do you manage your emotions? How do you relate with others? How do you um, connect with yourself and reflect and to understand those components? And I think, you know, it has been around for a while. Mm -hmm. um, And we've we've been touching on it. In fact, we have a whole course on it on how to use social emotional learning and the arts together. Um, but this year, I think, is going to take precedence over probably everything else mm-hmm. it should. Um, because our children have been away from others for 18 months, yeah. really, from peer interactions. And we know that they are struggling to understand, how do I communicate with somebody in person? Because all I've been doing is texting and looking at you in a Zoom room or maybe even turning off my camera and just right. listening, right? And, really are we listening but <laughs> but how do i then engage in a conversation and what does listening really look like what's active listening and it's not just me you know trying to think about my point and getting it in front of you and it's not about you know the social media clicks or getting the likes or anything like that teaching that intentionally weaving that into everything that we're doing that i think is the big push this year in education and, and it absolutely should be yeah it should be um you know and and real quick to i mean talking about the likes and stuff i mean eventually i i hope people are realizing it now likes don't mean anything right. they, they, they literally mean nothing right, but yeah. when you're dealing with a child yeah, whose entire life right. is friends and family if half of that is disliked, like 50% of their world has blown up, Right. you know? And so we have to recognize that. And I think we've traumatized our children. Yeah. I think we've traumatized them in, you know, gun shooting drills at school all the way through the pandemic and loss of loved ones. I, I can't and, imagine being in high school now with social media. Yeah, it has to be it's awful. Ju- right. I, it, I, no. It's bad. I won't and even give my, I will not give my child social media. I she wouldn't. really doesn't want it. I would love- well, your child's my child is different. <laughs> Your child is a whole different uh, <laughs> but, <It's> brilliant. <laughs> but sh- I would love for all social media to be uh, like just shut down for six months. And the only place that you can get your news is from a physical newspaper. Yeah. Like no TV. Get rid of all the news channels. Get rid of all the social media. I – I would challenge us as a society to do that for six months and see what happens yeah. if we're able to actually dialogue with well, each other again. Yeah, we don't know how to have conversations right. anymore. And yeah. I think this past year has, you know, well, it has really made that even worse. Well, yeah, and, and I think trauma. I think we've forgotten how to have a conversation because, again, because of these echo chambers. Now everyone's just under the idea that they have to be right. Mm-hmm. And that there can be no alternative point of view. And so now instead of being able to talk, you just it rises to anger because there's only one correct answer. Well, because you don't listen to right. understand. You listen to respond. Yeah, right. wh- exactly. What's the one saying? Everybody everybody listens just waiting for their turn to talk. Yeah. Like they don't actually listen to what mm-hmm. the other people are saying. Well, and <clears throat> I mean, to that point and to the point about learning to control your emotions, what I would tell people there that might be struggling with anger or anything else or any kind of emotion or anything that you've been holding on to, traumas, It's only hurting you Mm -hmm. the more you hold on to that, act out on that, treat other people poorly because of how you feel. It's only hurting you. That that took a while for me to get through my head. It's like my actions, you know, I might think, oh, I told that person. At the end of the day, it was me that looked like an idiot, Mm -hmm. that that looked like a moron screaming and yelling that, you know. So, again, if if there's anything you feel like you need to work on, definitely do it because at the end of the day, it's only going to benefit you, your future, your life, and what you're doing. So Yeah, and also – Consider your expectations. Yeah. Like we talk about having high expectations of students and what they're capable of. Sometimes I think we all get caught in the trap of having an expectation of how something will turn out yeah. before we've even started. So modify your expectations. Let yeah. them go. Yeah. Let them go and make sure that you're paying attention to the next thing in front of you and let everything else go. Yeah. I, I said it before, I say it again. My mom, always 100% correct. She would tell me all the time when I was little, the things you worry about never end up happening. That's right. And she was 100% correct the whole way through my life. So, yeah, yeah I was just, yeah, we'll throw that out there again. Well, and it's important, too, I think, to remember that the children are always watching. And they're oh, yeah. sponges. Mm-hmm. And they are not equipped with the vernacular or the language to articulate their feelings all the time. And so what they're seeing on social media on the news, in TV, on reality TV, all of these things, yeah. they're they're That's digesting right. and internalizing and yeah. then acting in the same way. So right. I think it's always important to remember. Well, that and again, a reason for this show, there needs to be more positive media as opposed to negative Agreed. media. Agreed, 100%. I, I look at what I do and I, I see what 
makes the money and it's it's all well and good but when you because i was a big fan of like mr rogers sesame street growing yeah. up it's like you know what i know media can be used for good things mm -hmm. so it's about time that more people start using it for that as opposed to hey new killing and whatever else that the news wants to throw at you to make you angry because that right. just makes them more money so right. uh well susan tiffany thank you so much for being with us here today thank you adam uh-huh and before we go where can everyone find you so our site is artsintegration.com okay Yep. And uh, do you have any, like, in, in office meetings, or is that by appointment, or most people don't come to the office? Most people do not come to the office. Gotcha. It's just for us and, as and our organization to okay. kind of work together. But certainly people are welcome if they'd like a tour. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a great little office, yeah. Um, and then uh, is there anyone outside of teachers that might find value in, in your online offerings? So we do have quite a few administrators um, who obviously support teachers, but also teaching artists um, as and parents. Parents found, especially during the pandemic, found a lot of our free materials really helpful for their for their own kiddos. Oh, good, good. Excellent. Well, everyone, um, be sure to check out art in artsintegration.com and what Susan and Tiffany have built here. It's pretty phenomenal. Uh, and for all of you listening, if you like and see what you hear today, please be sure to like, subscribe, leave a five-star review. And of course, you can leave a donation on our homepage at aroundtowncc.com. Uh, take care. Good be, be good to one another. And uh, we'll see you next time on Around Town. Thanks. Thanks.